everyone. This is Lindsay Cox with the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. We are going to go ahead and um, get started with today's webinar. Thank you guys very much for joining us. A um, couple of housekeeping things uh, just right off the top. I do have everybody participating um, set to mute just to um, hinder any potential background noise. I do encourage you to use the um, Zoom chat feature. If you have any questions while we're reviewing today's material, um, we don't actually anticipate um, the material going um, the full hour, so there should be plenty of time uh, to answer questions at the end. So again, uh, please feel free to type those in as you think of them, and then we'll cover those uh, at the end of the presentation. All right. So just to get us started here, once again, I'm Lindsay Cox. I'm the program manager uh, for the RIS program. Actually just joined the office um, about six weeks ago now, um, so be kind to me. <laughs> uh, and have, uh, am coming actually from a grantee organization, so have also been uh, on your side of the table um, and have worked in technology-based economic development for about the last seven years. Uh, and I'll let my uh, two colleagues who are joining me introduce themselves as well. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Emily Miller. Um, I've been in the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship for a little under a year now, um, and I've had the great opportunity to um, go through a full cycle of our, our RIS program in 2019 and, um, and also advise on, um, from a policy perspective, some changes to our 2020 competition. Um, so very excited for the webinar today and just to be able to answer any questions you have. And good afternoon or good morning, folks. For those West Coasters, uh, my name is Craig Bristatti. Uh, maybe fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, uh, some of you are, are, are very familiar with my voice. I've uh, been doing this for, for now five plus years. Um, and uh, for those of you who are familiar might, might realize this is a little bit different than normal. Uh, where this is our first time getting ahead of the program, really trying to provide stakeholders more opportunity uh, to prepare their strategies uh, and, and uh, just organizational groundwork uh, ready for the 2020 cycle. Uh, so we'll get into those details, uh, but, but really uh, thanks for your time and participation uh, today. I hope that this will allow all of you uh, to get moving. Uh, we want uh, as many great applications and, and new stakeholders to participate in the, in the 2020 cycle. Uh, I think uh, I'll also note that there are some real uh, exciting budget uh, activities happening right now, real time here in DC. So for those of you who are watching, uh, bottom line, we're looking at potentially the largest pool of funds for the 2020. 2020 cycle here. Uh, so great time to get started on your plans. All right. Thanks, Craig. Um, so to kick it off and, and also to reiterate what Craig said, today will be kind of a, a brief overview of the program, uh, looking at the last several years as well as last year's data as we prepare for 2020. We'll actually have um, another webinar as we get even closer to the competition um, and are able to release the details of that competition specifically um, that we'll go through uh, probably in late January, so you can stay tuned for that as well. Um, so with that, um, what we're all here for today, uh, the Regional Innovation Strategies Program, uh, just a little bit of background on, on this program. It was authorized by the uh, America Competes Act in 2010 with a primary focus around spurring innovation and capacity building in activities uh, uh, in regions across the country. Since the first round of funding in 2014, we have made 224 investments in 48 states and two territories using uh, a little over $100 million in federal funding, which has been uh, has leveraged $120 million in community match dollars. We'll get into to those match requirements as we go through this. Uh, and that has led to the creation of over 8,200 jobs and a billion dollars in follow-on capital. We also have project profiles for um, every grantee listed on our website, and that link is provided. And we'll get into that detail as well later on as you're thinking through your strategy where you can uh, check out some of our past winners. 
so first, I uh, will touch on our two competitions, the I6 Challenge and the Seed Fund Support Grant. So RIS in itself is made up of these two separate competitions. More details about them are available on our website. We do anticipate releasing the new competition for 2020 uh, in early 2020. You'll see information about that uh, hopefully as early as January with a notice of funding opportunity in early February and applications that could be due as early as March. So first to touch on the I-6 challenge, uh, this has funded a range of different programs and opportunities, but kind of the central factor uh, that we see in alignment is that they are all addressing scalable businesses within the community. So as you're thinking about this, organizations should be aiming to strengthen competitiveness through new product innovation or new technology adoption, improve the commercialization of research, enhance the overall innovation capacity and re resiliency for their region, and leverage regional competitive strengths to stimulate innovation and job growth within their community. And grantees uh, have included everyone from nonprofits to universities to economic development organizations and public-private partnerships. I do have uh, something very specific highlighted in red there, which is that funding cannot go directly to startups. So this funding is to support operational and programmatic expenses, but not to be passed through directly to companies. And with that, I'm going to let Craig talk through uh, two grantee highlights. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. And I'm glad to see that uh, we're starting off first with a community college. Uh, reason being is that list of example uh, awardees that we've made, so nonprofits, universities, community colleges, uh, I think the I-6 program uh, is a true testament to entrepreneurship in general, where uh, every region, uh, every sector uh, tackles it a little bit differently insofar as the type of support, uh, programs, mentorship, and resources uh, needed. Uh, and in this case, in upstate New York, Mohawk Valley Community College, uh, located nearby a local Air Force Re Research Lab, uh, has identified a growing cluster of cyber and unmanned aerial systems uh, technologies and uh, created the Thinkubator. Uh, I think the Thinkubator itself was, was started in, in 2015, late 2015 or 16, uh, and our award in 2017 uh, was really focused on uh, better connecting the assets in that region, running the programs, and the operations of the Thinkubator uh, to support more entrepreneurs. Uh, I, I think I'll call out what, what we like about this one is the real organic synergy between the community college, the Air Force Research Lab, and the community itself. Uh, the Thinkubator, uh, interesting fact, is off campus in the heart of, of downtown in Utica, New York. Uh, so it can be accessed by both students and residents of all backgrounds uh, that share one uh, unifying interest, and, and that is technology entrepreneurship. Uh, and you see the metrics up there, uh, a lot of progress in the last few years. Uh, and I think especially interesting given that Utica uh, is a small town uh, and the surrounding area is, is largely rural. Uh, so, great example of how uh, truly all types of communities and organizations can benefit from this program. Uh, next up, though, is uh, a, a, a very different type of community uh, out in Rhode Island, uh, the Social Enterprise uh, Greenhouse, uh, which is, uh, you know, the state generally is not known uh, for its, its massive technology assets. Uh, but SEG, uh, as they're called informally, Social Enterprise Greenhouse, has really uh, worked hard to lay uh, or create, I should say, a connected network of social enterprise activities. Uh, and that's what our grant is focused on, uh, to build two new satellite locations, um, 
uh, inventory and prepare for so some opportunity zone work uh, and through some landscape analysis, some outreach and, and partnership development, uh, and ultimately, uh, maybe in short, leveraging uh, that smaller states' assets uh, through better, stronger, more efficient connected connections uh, to move entrepreneurship forward. Again, some very different metrics here, um, uh, and I, I think what I want to drive home about these two different projects are that uh, what they're working on is very relevant and impactful for their communities and the types of entrepreneurs uh, and technologies coming out of those regions. Uh, so I, don't be tempted here to compare your programs uh, or your uh, activities and your impact metrics to these. These are just examples. Uh, I know we drove home earlier that, that uh, there's well over 200 total projects. Um, these are not prescriptive. Uh, these are two of 224. So please, we encourage you to check out the rest of those profiles. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Craig. And while we're highlighting that, I did just want to touch on, um, as you can see, they are these are two very different projects, but I did want to point out their commonalities as Craig started to. Um, they really leverage their respective uh, region's resources well. So in one case, you have uh, the leveraging of the Air Force Base, and then in the case um, of SEG, you have them leveraging uh, the Opportunity Zone component as well as uh, other uh, key qualifiers of their state, uh, and that they are both addressing scalable entrepreneurship within their projects. And so with that, we're going to move into the Seed Fund Support grant, grant Competition. So again, this is a separate competition from the I-6, and I'll let Emily cover it. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Um, so just want to cover some of the basics of the Seed Fund Support Program. Um, the overarching goal here is to, to really deploy uh, capital within communities, regions, and industries. Um, and so the Seed, for, Seed Fund Support Grant is really meant to um, catalyze these, these activities. So what this does is really provide operational support um, for either the formation, launch and scale of investment funds that are basically investing in scalable startups in a region, or it can go to organizations with a goal to expand capital deployment within a community. Um, so that could look very different depending on the community. It could be um, an angel network. It could be um, an investor training program. It could be a hybrid model, um, such as uh, things like revenue-based financing that utilize kind of equity redemption as a component. Um, the big thing to point out, um, very similar to um, stipulations with our I-6, is that these funds are really meant for the back end, right? So they're meant to support the technical assistance, the operational costs, the marketing, the outreach. They are not used to capitalize the fund itself, and they're also not um, used to actually invest directly in startups. So um, that's kind of the overarching goal of the seed fund support. It's a, it's a fairly flexible program, but the emphasis really is on scalable, high growth startups. Um, so not anything like you know loans, lending programs, revolving loan funds, things like that. Um, it's really meant for those kind of equity-based, high growth um, investments. Great. And with that, we're going to give a couple examples um, of prior seed fund support grantees. I think so many of us know uh, the very hot topic of capital concentration right now in, in the U.S., where roughly 75 to 80 percent of venture dollars are deployed between three or four states, um, California, Massachusetts, New York, and, and uh, Texas is quickly catching up on, on that level with, with what's happening across the I-35 corridor between Austin and Houston. Uh, but uh, the three top players are those states. Um, uh, and talking about the heartland and what's happening in St. Louis, though, uh, is really something else with respect to their uh, very fast-growing uh, bioscience uh, business cluster, and uh, 
really supported by one of a number of ac actors in the region there, the, the BioGenerator, uh, a key partner with BioSTL. Uh, some of you might be familiar with their work. Um, and they received a 2017 seed fund support grant uh, to stand up uh, a seed fund, uh, a little over $8 million. Uh, and uh, what, what I find compelling about this project is uh, they are the biogenerator and bioSTL. They are leaders in, in helping uh, mentor and uh, develop early stage uh, bio life science companies. Uh, and because of that, uh, they're a bit of a, a key uh, partner and really a position player uh, in that broader community. And at the bottom of that write-up, you see uh, we'll support 110 million in additional investment. So, uh, because of their convening role uh, and their ability to bring uh, complementary partners together through this eight-plus million dollar fund, uh, they're helping coalesce a ton more capital across the region uh, that likely would have I, a not been deployed or been deployed much less efficiently, uh, slower, et cetera. So uh, in their leadership capacity with a capital component to their programs, uh, they of course are, are actively deploying capital, but serving also as uh, a, a convener for others to get that done. So um, really a, a compelling example here um, uh, uh, maybe a, a core uh, offering, excuse me, a, a core uh, example of, of how the seed fund support program can be uh, leveraged. Uh, maybe uh, moving on though to a slightly different example uh, is Launch New York, uh, where it did not launch uh, a specific fund uh, with, uh, with this grants, but worked to build out their mentorship network uh, that was largely comprised, uh, is largely comprised of, of active investors, some are angel investors and, and business executives, uh, with the idea of increasing connectivity, increasing participation in this stage of, uh, uh, of investment and, and seed um, mentorship will ultimately increase or unlock, I should say, more capital. Um, so uh, their investor network uh, complements our interests to Emily's point of increasing the flow of, of venture capital throughout a region uh, and does not necessarily have to be a standalone uh, specific venture fund. Uh, so uh, I think on that note, um, uh, I, I'd highlight that, once again, just check out our project profiles and, and the true spectrum of work that we're supporting. Um, I, I will also add that I, I realize that this is, uh, I just mentioned about the, the concentration of capital uh, on the coast, and, and particularly New York, but Launch New York is operating exclusively in, in upstate uh, Buffalo, Albany, and tends to be, uh, and in between, fairly rural and, and with, with much less uh, high growth uh, venture type of activity happening. So they're filling a, a fantastic gap here that's really important for that, that part of, of the, the region uh, and, and a valuable asset for entrepreneurs across the state there. Um, that's it on, on the seed fund. Uh, just two examples of, of many. Uh, please check out the profiles. Highly encourage that. Yeah, and I think what is so great about highlighting these two examples is you can see um, two clear uh, different strategies uh, focus on the deployment of capital. So one, uh, in the first case, a biogenerator that is raising and activating a seed fund, and then the other, as Craig just discussed, with Launch New York, which is uh, building out this angel network, uh, but again, both are going to lead to that deployment of capital for these underserved regions. All right, uh, so we'll touch on funding levels really quick. Uh, so for the I-6 challenge, uh, those are set up to $750,000 grants over a three-year project period. 
So that does not mean 750,000 per year. It is 750,000 over the life of the award. And on the seed fund support, those are 300,000, again, over that three-year project period. Both of these require a one-to-one -one match. So for every dollar uh, of money that you apply for through us, you have to be prepared on the back end to match that, whether through cash in kind or a combination of both. I do have links up here for our uh, past year's award uh, winners for 2019 uh, in both categories, but you can also see prior years from before that. And then just to touch on the overall budget for the program, uh, in 2019, we were a $23.5 million program, which enabled us to do 44 grants. We are currently in the budget at 33 million, which is very exciting and should enable us to fund some more projects. Again, those are preliminary numbers until uh, the final budget is passed, but we uh, are anticipating that low 30s number for 2020. So just to summarize a bit about what we've discussed today, uh, you should expect an announcement in uh, January with a notice of funding for February. Uh, one thing that we had not touched on yet, but I'll go ahead and do that now, is that we are working on um, some, rev some revision to the language within the competition for 2020, but the spirit will remain the same. So if when everything goes live in January and February, you're seeing some terminology that's new, don't let that uh, scare you off or make you think you're in the wrong place. You are absolutely in the right place. Um, and again, the spirit of the competition is going to remain the same. So what can you work on uh, in the coming weeks uh, as uh, prior to those announcements? Uh, some really great things to do are to focus on your strategic plan for applying for the program. So building your application strategy uh, and identifying what you're going to apply with specifically. Another great thing is to meet with partners and ensure that you're really leveraging the resources of the community and region. And then finally, uh, go ahead and start building out your budget, including that match component, which again is, is a requirement and where it's going to come. And just to highlight some best practices that you uh, probably noticed as we went through our, uh, our examples of uh, other funded projects, uh, clearly defined strategy and partnership that again really leverage uh, those resources of the region, a complete budget including match that ties back directly to your project narrative, a narrative that is specific and actionable and has great program details within it. And then also an application that is authentic to your capacity and community. The I-6 and seed fund support are not meant to be one size fit all programs. So while we do encourage you to look at prior year uh, awardees, also think about what is authentic for your community and what uh, goals are reachable um, and achievable as you seek this funding. And so I'll close up today uh, leaving this contact information if it uh, loads on the slide. Sorry, got a little bit of a lag time here. Um, something else that you can do in the coming weeks if you have not already done so is to get in touch with your regional office we do have those uh, contacts up here on the screen for you, as well as our contact information uh, here for the OIE office. And then at the beginning, uh, individual contact information for myself, Craig, and Emily. And so with that, we will go ahead and open this up for questions. Again, if you can use the Zoom group chat box to type those, uh, and we'll, we'll start with those. And, and I'd love to add to, I know many of you are, are uh, long-time EDA stakeholders, so uh, if you have an existing relationship with, with another economic development representative or another team member, feel free to engage them on, on this program. Uh, these contacts here, uh, Robin Cooley and Chevis Grana and Brian Parker and so forth, uh, they are uh, to serve as, as the local or I should say the regional uh, representative uh, for this particular program. 
but all our team members in the field should be able to uh, talk to the program basics and, and uh, hopefully get you squared away. Uh, and if not, they'll get you to someone who can uh, talk in more depth and specifics on the program. Uh, also, while we're uh, on this fast best practices and, and wait for any questions to come in, uh, I, we always get, uh, I just want to get in front of this question, we always get a lot of questions around uh, match uh, and uh, what, what type of match is eligible and, and how to put that forth. Uh, this program, uh, we do allow uh, and welcome both cash uh, and, and in-kind services. Uh, so cash, whether that's a budget on hand or, or from uh, someone else, uh, but uh, the, the catch is that all of those matching resources must be uh, readily available and committed to the project uh, at the time of, of the potential award. Uh, so we asked for some language there, and you can you can dig into uh, former uh, funding opportunities. I highly encourage that as well to see uh, what some of those requirements were. Uh, but uh, bottom line, uh, eligibility guidelines is both cash and in kind are eligible, uh, and most importantly, think about. Uh, I think strategically, I, I, I would ask you to think about how uh, those matching resources can complement the needs of your project or the needs of your community, uh, as that is a, a really important component of how we look at uh, the resources and, and the expertise uh, that's brought to bear in, in a proposal. Um, Hope that helps shine a light on a match. Yeah, thank you. Um, and we did have a question come in. I'll read that aloud before we respond. So um, for for uh, each round of funding, do we have any deadlines? And then approximately how many applications do we receive for the I-6 grant? Um, so uh, it is an annual competition. So what that means for from our perspective is we'll open it up and so it'll be one per year. So this one will again open in early February. Uh, we expect to make award announcements in August for that. Um, and as of right now, we are about five times oversubscribed for the program itself. Um, so for those 44 that we made, we had uh, another, uh, you know, 150, 200 that we were not able to make, uh, but we are excited to, to see that increase in funding and hopefully be able to make uh, more awards this coming year. And, uh, and I'd also like to, to uh, further explain a little bit on that note that uh, I would focus less on, on the numbers uh, that we get and, and more so on your readiness for this type of work. Uh, there, the, the applicants we receive do run a range from uh, not quite ready for this type of uh, entrepreneurship work or to those that are experts and, and very competitive. Uh, so if, if you feel that, that you're an expert team and doing this well, you know, I think we'd strongly encourage you to participate uh, and uh, don't, don't do don't overthink it, I guess, is, is the <laughs> lesson. Um, on Bob's note, I, it's the same note, uh, same point. Bob, I appreciate the question on... Uh, let me, can I read it out loud? Sorry, thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Bob, thank you for sending a, that in. So the question was, if they had received a prior award in 2018 for I-6, does that impact chances for a seed fund support for this upcoming cycle? Um, no, uh, the, uh, in fact, going back to the program overall, um, I think a great way to look at it is uh, if we're successful under the activities uh, of the I-6 portfolio, meaning we're, we're supporting entrepreneurs, we're helping them start and create businesses, uh, naturally those entrepreneurs will have a demand for capital. Uh, so, it, it, in many cases, it, it makes perfect sense to complement I-6 activity uh, with seed fund support work. Um, now, it, it, 
you could also have uh, an I-6 project that is focused on uh, one industry and a seed fund support project that's entirely focused on a different industry. That's fine. Um, ultimately, applications are reviewed independent of one another, uh, uh, but there is some consideration to geographic and overall industry balance. Um, but I, also, I wouldn't read into that too much, and, and let me explain a couple of variables here. Uh, we're entering uh, the sixth year of this competition, and, and really the seventh competition overall. Uh, we've got awards in 48 states and two territories. Uh, so I think we've, we've really uh, hit uh, most corners of, of the nation. Uh, there's a couple communities uh, there's a number of communities I know that, that we could we could uh, get some support to, uh, but generally speaking, we anticipate uh, making follow-on investments into the same communities more frequently uh, to help those communities build on earlier efforts. Uh, and I think I'll emphasize that building on earlier efforts or complementing efforts where where continued gaps exist. Uh, so. Uh, a, a very generic example, uh, if there are two organizations within a broader metro area uh, that are doing the same work that you are doing and they both received awards from us, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth a serious consideration around how you can, can best complement that work uh, and, and does it really make sense for us to support a similar project. Uh, I, I'd say the best counter to that uh, would be um, if perhaps there are two I six projects in a community. Uh, can is it time? Would it be pro appropriate for a seed fund grant, or is it time for a different I six supporting a different industry, a different demographic, and, and so on and so forth? But. Uh, we recognize there will be a concentration of activity in, in certain communities. Um, and Melissa from St. Louis, uh, you know, we, we called out the biogenerator there, and we do have a, a couple other projects in, in St. Louis. And if you look at the assets across uh, Missouri, uh, Illinois, and Southern Illinois there, uh, there's not a, a ton of communities that can pull off life science business incubation or this type of venture investment. Uh, so it, it is okay uh, to have some concentration of activity uh, and we anticipate that, uh, but just be, be thoughtful about the entire picture. Uh, Lindsay, do you have anything else you might add to that? No, I think that was a great synopsis. Okay. Um, truly, uh, we do not have any other questions pending right now. Do you want to take a few moments before we close out to again highlight that we will be having another webinar in uh, mid to late January once we have uh, finalized the details of the 2020 competition and can uh, talk about those more freely. Uh, so I would encourage you to tune in then. We'll get a little more nuanced and uh, make sure we're pointing out any kind of clear distinctions between the 2019 and 2020 program at that time. Uh, do you guys have anything else to add today? I, I really think it is uh, just a, such a great time to start building those partnerships and those plans because when the competition does go live, uh, you know, things just get really, really busy and, and every year we hear from a couple of folks that they weren't able to uh, get enough minimum match or, or, or maybe it was too hastily done that a partner did drop out last minute. So. Uh, it's the holiday season, uh, and I know it's hard to get going now, uh, but February and the 2020 competition will be here before you know it. Uh, we look forward to your participation. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us this afternoon, uh, and thank you to Craig, and thank you for Emily for joining me, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you all. Have a nice day, everyone.